Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be here with you. I wish you were here with me. I can uh, tell you that uh, even though I'm doing fine, and I hope all of you are too, that I really miss you. I miss uh, uh, being around you. I miss your faces, uh, and uh, especially as I stand here and talk. For the last month, I've been saying Mass by myself, and um, I've gotten a little more comfortable with uh, talking uh, to an empty church and trying to, uh, trying to um, uh, speak that way. But, uh, but I really miss you. Last week, I had a funeral, and we had 10 people here, and we were uh, distancing ourselves appropriately. And I know it was a grief for the family that uh, there were only uh, the 10 of us here because the grandkids of this man couldn't be here and other family and friends couldn't be here. And so there was something really sad about that. But I told them, for me, they were a big crowd. That was the first time that I've had anybody here in church uh, for the last month uh, when I was saying Mass. And it was great when I would say, the Lord be with you, for somebody to actually say, and with your spirit, back to me. There was something just very comforting. I actually got very uh, emotional during the service because of that. I, re I realized how much I was, I was missing all of that. And so um, I'm glad to be able to be here with you today and uh, to share with you some of the, uh, the, um, the teaching of the church. Um, before we got shut down for this year, I've been doing an RCIA for Catholics. We'll continue that uh, next fall. Uh, but we had gone through... The section of the catechism, which deals with the doctrinal teaching of the church, that's essentially the creed, and then uh, we had moved a few months ago into the teachings on the sacraments, and we had gone through the first five of the sacraments, but there were still two to go, marriage and holy orders, when we were shut down. Now, my hope was that sometime here after Easter that we would be able to regather and, and uh, to, to finish that up, but it looks like our... Uh, it's going to be a while before we are able to, to reconnect with one another that way. And so thank goodness we have this uh, capacity for me to, uh, to be with you uh, online, to be with you uh, virtually rather than, uh, than directly. And so I decided that I just wanted to go ahead and to complete this series. Uh, for one thing, uh, maybe to give you something else to do, something else to, to listen to, and I hope it's somewhat inspirational for you and instructional for you at home. But I'm glad to be able to do that with you uh, today. I want to review a little bit, review a little bit. Uh, we've been talking about the sacraments. And the definition of the sacraments that I'm using is the same one that I learned in first grade. And that many of you learned as well, and it was the, uh, the uh, Baltimore Catechism definition that a sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. There are these three essential pieces to that definition. Now, there are other really wonderful definitions. They are somewhat similar uh, to that one. I just like how succinct it is. I think I like how direct it is and how these three um, parts really tell us everything we need to know about sacraments. Now, we need to flesh that out, but it gives us that. And a sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. Right? Now, let's talk about this. Um, outward signs. Every one of the sacraments has an outward sign. Uh, St. Augustine, in fact, in his definition of uh, sacraments says that, the, that they are uh, out, outer signs, outward signs of an inner reality. And so the real importance of the sacrament is what is happening spiritually, what's happening inside. It is invisible, but we all have these outer signs, these outer signs, right? So baptism, obviously, uh, it is about water. And the pouring of the water at baptism is a symbol of the washing away of sin, and it is also a symbol of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, and really pouring the whole Trinity into the heart and the soul of the individual. An outward sign. Then the Eucharist, bread and wine, is the outward sign. Now the inner reality is the body and the blood of Christ. Again, not the dead body and not the dead blood of Christ, but the living body and blood of Christ. It is the living Lord Jesus Christ that we are receiving as we eat uh, um, the bread and the wine, or at least the under what is under the appearance of bread and wine. We actually are receiving Jesus himself. 
Um, also, then we have oil that is used in a few of the sacraments. Laying on of hands is uh, one of the signs, the outer, outward signs. And so we see that every one of the sacraments, in some way or another, uses an outward sign to convey some invisible reality, to make that happen. So outward signs instituted by Christ. Now these ceremonies that we celebrate, that we call the sacraments, were not created by the apostles or by the early church. It was not they sat around and said, well, you know what, we need to have some ceremonies, some rituals, if we're going to uh, have a real religion. No, Jesus himself gave us each of the sacraments. Again, baptism. Jesus' own baptism is the beginning of that. We are told that he actually baptized. And then at the very end of his uh, life here on earth, just moments before he ascended to the Father, he tells the apostles, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we see then in the Acts of the Apostles, and we see in the writings of St. Paul, that this was taken seriously by the church. And so Jesus gives us this sacrament, uh, this outward sign for us to continue. In the Eucharist, again, Jesus at the Last Supper takes bread and breaks it, blesses it, gives it to his disciples and says, take this and eat, this is my body. He takes the cup, blesses it, gives it to his disciples and said, take this and drink, this is the cup of my blood. Do this in memory of me. So Jesus gives us both baptism and the Eucharist. Confession, the sacrament of reconciliation. We just heard that this past Sunday when Jesus appeared to the apostles on that first Easter Sunday night. And the scripture says that he breathed on them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you shall forgive are forgiven them whose sins you shall retain are retained. So Jesus instituted this sacrament of reconciliation, the sacrament of confession, or the sacrament of penance. All three of those titles are appropriate. He gives us that sacrament. We didn't dream that up. He gives that to the church. So all, th all seven of the sacraments are outward signs instituted by Christ to give grace to give grace. Now, the church talks about two kinds of grace. The first is what we call uncreated grace. Now, uncreated grace, it's uncreated because it's God himself. It is the Holy Trinity that is dwelling within us. It is our union with God. It is our union with God. And this is how we were created. We were created for union with God. But we lost that union. When our first parents rebelled against God, and they said, no, we don't want to be united with you. We're going to be united with this other guy. We're going to follow him. See, God never rejected the human race. The human race rejected God. And so God says, if I'm not welcome, I'm not welcome. And so he doesn't force himself on us. He never forces himself on us. But he does say, this is not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. So at the fall... What happened was that we lost that union, that inner, that grace of the inner life of God. Now that is what is restored to us in baptism. Because of the death and the resurrection of Christ and what flows from that, then we are restored. We are restored to that union and that grace, that, that inner grace, that sanctifying grace is what the church calls that. That sanctifying grace, we are restored to that union. It is also this union with God, this sanctifying grace, that we lose if we fall into mortal sin. Where again, like our first parents, we say, I reject God. I'm not going to do God's will. I'm not going to do God's plan. God, I know what you want me to do. I'm listening to this dude. I'm listening to this guy. I'm going to follow him. And we turn our backs on God. And then if we have done that, we repent and we come back to him. How do we come back to him? Through the sacrament of reconciliation. Whose sins you shall forgive are forgiven them. And we are restored to sanctifying grace. We are restored to that union with the Holy Trinity. This is what we mean when we talk about being in a state of grace. 
is that I am in union with God. And it's what we mean when we say I'm not in a, in a state of, of grace. It means that I have turned my back on God, and either I haven't repented yet, or I'm in the process of repenting, but have not yet confessed and received absolution. <coughs> Pardon me. And so that's uncreated grace. There's also created grace. Now, created grace is not God himself. Created grace is also called actual grace, and it is power. It is energy, spiritual energy or spiritual power created by God and given to us so that we can live lives of holiness, to give us the strength, to give us the virtues that we need in order to be faithful to God. And so each of the sacraments gives us grace. Two of them, baptism and reconciliation, give us sanctifying grace, create uncreated, excuse me, yeah, uncreated grace. <coughs> all seven of them, all seven of the, the sacraments are sources of actual grace, of the created grace. And we turn to them seeking that energy, seeking that power, that work in us so that we can be who God is calling us to be. So we have outward signs instituted by Christ to give grace, to give uncreated grace, sanctifying grace, and to give created grace, actual grace. Now, again, when we were talking about sacraments, we divided them up into three uh, groups. And this is kind of an arbitrary teaching uh, method. The first three are what we call the sacraments of initiation. These are the sacraments that uh, we normally would have been celebrating uh, at the Easter Vigil. It would have been baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. They are the sacraments that are given to us through which we become members of the church. We become full, fully part of the church through those sacraments. And so that's why they are initiation. We are being initiated into the church through those sacraments. All right? Then we have the sacraments of healing. Jesus' ministry involved a lot of healing. Healing was the thing that drew people to Jesus first and foremost. And so we have two sacraments of healing, the sacrament of reconciliation that we've already been discussing, and the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Now, today and next week, we're going to be talking about the last group of sacraments, the last two, matrimony or marriage and holy orders. And these are known as sacraments for the sake of communion. All right? And they are, they are different than the other sacraments. We do receive graces in them. We receive actual graces. We don't receive sanctifying graces from them. We receive actual graces. But we receive them not for ourselves. See, the other five sacraments I receive for myself, for my own sanctification, for my own salvation. But the graces that we receive in marriage and in holy orders are for the sake of others. If I'm getting married, I receive the grace of the sacrament of matrimony, but not for my own sake. I receive those graces so that I can love my spouse, so that I can serve my spouse, so that I can lay down my life with and for my spouse. Now she's receiving the grace of matrimony in order to do the same for me so that she can serve me, so that she can love me, so she can lay down her life for me. This is what we do. It's not, it's not for ourselves. Same thing with holy orders. The man who receives holy orders that we'll talk about next week is not receiving that for his own sake, but for the sake of the church, the people that he is called to serve. That's why he receives that sacrament. And that's what makes these two sacraments unique, is that they are not for the one who is receiving it, but it is for others. It is for others. Uh, we're going to be talking now about marriage. All right. Christopher West is a uh, wonderful speaker who has done a lot of work uh, on natural family planning and, is, uh, and on the, uh, the gospel of life. And, um, and so he has done a lot of really wonderful work uh, on, on, and all of that and many, many uh, great talks. Some of you are familiar with him. Some of you maybe have read some of his books or seen some of his, uh, his uh, videos. Uh, I really encourage you to check him out. He is very, very good. And uh, one of the things that he says is that the family is the basic unit of society 
and the church. It's the basic unit of society and the church. The basic unit of society is not the individual. It is the family. It is not society itself. See, in a, in a communist uh, uh, government, then the state is the, itself is the basic unit of the state. And everything is subservient to the state. And then in a highly individualized culture such as we have here in the United States, we have a tendency to see the individual as the primary, as the, as the, as the um, uh, basic unit of, of, of society. And it's not. It's not. It's the family. See, every individual comes out of a family. Now, maybe not a good family. It may be a broken family. It may be a shattered family. It may be an incredibly awful family, or it may be a really wonderful family, or maybe a really good family, or maybe some kind of a mixed, but we all come out of some kind of a family, some kind of a family in some way, shape, or form. And whatever kind of family we're coming out of shapes us to a great extent. Healthy individuals, for the most part, come out of healthy families. Healthy societies come out of healthy families. If the family and a society is essentially sick, the society is going to be sick. If the families, family is essentially sick, the individuals are going to be essentially sick. Now, it doesn't say there's not other uh, variables that have impact there, but the well-being of the family is the most important thing that we can do in order to have a healthy society and a healthy uh, individual and a healthy church, and a healthy church. The family is called the domestic church, the domestic church. And so the basic unit of the church is not the parish, it's not even the diocese, it's the family. It's the family. The family is where it happens. The family is where it gets lived out for the, uh, in many, many different ways. It's, again, it's not to say there aren't other aspects of that, but the family is the core of all of that. So the family is the basic u- unit of society, and it is the basic unit of the church. So, he says, as the family goes, so goes society. And as the family goes, so goes the church. Then he goes on. He's talking about marriage here. He says, as marriage goes, so goes the family. As marriage goes, so goes the family. Marriage is the core. It is the rock on which family is built. Now, that's not to say that there are not really wonderful families where there's not a marriage, right? But that's not the ideal. That's not the ideal. We don't just throw marriage out and say, well, it's just uh, uh, for those who want it. Uh, We can build families any way we want. No. What we see is from the very beginning of time, we look back in virtually every culture of human beings that has existed from the very beginning, and there was marriage. Now, there might not have been the ceremonies that you and I are familiar with, but there were individuals who came together and created family, and created family. And so the family is dependent upon the marriage. If the marriage is healthy, then it's going to be a healthy uh, family. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be, because we're all a mixed bag. Every one of us is a mixed bag. So it doesn't mean there aren't going to be some of the kids who are going to uh, have problems. It doesn't mean that whatsoever. You know, we are a fallen human race. We are living in a fallen world. And even the best family was going to deal with many different struggles and difficulties. But what we have to understand is that if we want a healthy society, if we want a healthy church, If we want healthy individuals, the most important thing we need to do is to get marriage right, to understand what it is and what it is intended to be. Everything, everything, society depends upon it, the church depends upon it, individuals depend upon it. Now, it is in this area of marriage and uh, and then uh, sexuality and gender issues uh, that is uh, where the church is at its greatest disconnect between the church and the society that we live in, right? And uh, we certainly see uh, attitudes towards society concerning gender. You know, what do we believe about gender? 
and our, uh, this has been a b the big thing in the last 20, 30 years, has been gender itself. Uh, what is gender? Does gender matter? Is gender determined by our birth? Or is it something that we choose and decide uh, upon later on? Um, we have the issues going on of, uh, of same-sex marriage and the whole meaning of what sex and sexuality is about. Now, I want to tell you that I'm not going to be dealing with that today. All right? um, the, this important topic, it's an important topic, but I'm not going to get into that today. That's a different topic for a different time. Next year, when I get into the, uh, the teaching of the church on morality, specifically when I get into uh, the, the Sixth Commandment, I will be addressing the church's teaching on these matters. It is very complicated. It is very contentious because the church's position, if we embrace the church's position, it puts us in opposition to the world or puts the world in opposition to us. As we go through today, too, uh, talking about marriage, I am not going to be focusing on divorce, divorce and annulments. It's an important issue. It's an important issue, but it's for another time. I want to talk about not what about when marriages break down. I want to talk today about what marriages are intended to be. I'm going to be holding up the ideal. And again, I recognize, I acknowledge that, uh, that, uh, that all of us in, in various ways fail to reach the ideal. And some uh, couples really struggle with that and, and, the, and the marriage relationship really breaks down. All right? I acknowledge that, but that's not what I'm focusing on today. I want us to at least take some time today to look at what marriage is intended to be, what the church's vision of marriage is, whether or not we, serve, we, we uh, reach that or not. All right? So, Let's talk about marriage, first of all, from the scriptures, especially in the New Testament. What do we have there? Well, and, and uh, we're going to see that this is also about, what, uh, about Jesus, about Jesus and this sacrament of marriage. And the first thing that we see is the, um, is the marriage feast of Cana. This is what the church looks back to as uh, is uh, certainly one of the ways in which Jesus institutes the sacrament of marriage is by being present at the wedding feast of Cana. Not only is he there, but his apostles are there, and the Blessed Mother is there. Now, we don't know for a fact whose wedding this was. There are some early church traditions that indicate it may have been John, the beloved disciple, that it was his marriage, which would explain why Jesus was there and why the apostles uh, were there. Also, the scriptures uh, or the, the early church tradition indicates that John's mother, right, John's mother uh, was the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus, which would mean that Mary would have been the aunt of John, who, uh, the beloved disciple who was getting married. Now, we don't know if any of that's historically accurate or not, but there are some early church traditions which point in that direction. But we do know that Jesus and Mary and the apostles were there. And, of course, we know the story about the fact that, uh, that they run out of wine. They run out of wine, and Jesus changes the water into wine. So there we see Jesus at this wedding. Uh, the church looks at that so uh, profoundly that for a long time we have referred to our marriage preparation programs as pre-Cana, pre-Cana, pre-marriage. Right? So we see there, marriage is taken so seriously uh, by the scriptures. We see in the teaching of Jesus. And when Jesus teaches about marriage, it's primarily he's teaching about the indissolu indissolubility of marriage. That marriage is permanent. That marriage is forever. And there he does get in to the issue of divorce and remarriage. Now again, that's not what I'm going to be getting into today. We'll get into that at another time, but that's not what I'm focusing on today. I'm just saying that Jesus is teaching us that marriage is indissoluble, that marriage is forever, forever, no matter what. St. Paul, in his uh, writings, touches on marriage, and he gives us this amazing image for marriage. He says that marriage is a type of the relationship between Christ and his bride, the church. So when Paul looks at a husband and wife as they are promising themselves to one another, as they are pledging themselves to one another, he sees Christ promising himself to 
his bride. And we see, he sees Jesus on the cross laying down his life for his bride. He says at one point to husbands, he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves his bride, the church. As Christ loves his bride, the church. So the church, the church, one of the most important images that is given to us in the scriptures, in the gospels, or, and in the New Testament in general, is that the church is the bride of Christ. He is our bridegroom who lays down his life for us, who sacrifices himself for us. And he's teaching us through that that this is how we are to love one another. This is how we are to love one another, to love one another as Christ has loved us. And that's the cross. That's the cross. The cross gives us more perfectly than anything else an understanding of what love looks like of what love looks like. So there we see this in St. Paul. St. Paul will also deal some, which I am not going to today, with the issue of divorce. He especially is dealing with the issue of couples who, uh, when one, because most couples were coming to the church at that point, would have been either Jewish couples or they would have been pagan couples. And if one has been converted and joins the church, whether it's a Jewish person or it is a pagan person, and uh, their spouse says, absolutely not. I will not go. I will not become part of that. And if they leave that person, all right, he deals with the issue of, uh, of whether or not they can be married. Again, all right, this is what's called the Pauline privilege. Another talk, another talk. And then in the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, towards the end of the book of Revelation, the very last chapters, all right, we see the, uh, the, the, the new Jerusalem is the church, all right, descending from heaven. And it is described as the bride of the Lamb. All through the scriptures, Jesus is the Lamb, the Lamb of God, the Lamb that has been slain but who lives. And the church, again, is the bride of the Lamb. You know, it's interesting that human history, in the scriptures anyway, is portrayed, first of all, with the marriage of Adam and Eve in the garden, and then the marriage of Jesus and his church, Christ and his church, at the end of time. And so the entire scripture and the entire history of the human race is bookended by this concept of marriage. Now marriage, there are three different ways for us to look at marriage. And the society uh, looks at marriage and, and also the Jewish uh, community and, we as, and, and Christian community. And then how we as Catholics uh, look at marriage. Our society looks at marriage as a contract, a private contract. Again, especially here in the United States, where we have such a high uh, sense of individualism. And so a marriage is just me entering into a marriage with you. It is between us. It is between us. All right? And so, you know, we can enter into it when we want to. I can marry whoever uh, I want to. And I can end this. We can end this whenever we want to. This marriage is just simply a private contract between two people. Now, it is then uh, by society, it is watched over by society, and so in the, and the promises that are made are, are, uh, are guaranteed by society, and it is society that, that gives you a certificate to get married, and, married, and it is also a society that will give you a certificate of divorce and decide whether or not, uh, but, but it essentially is seeing it as a private contract that is being monitored by the state. The Jewish community and the Christian community see a second dimension, much, much richer, and that is the dimension of covenant. Then when we enter into a marriage, we are not just entering into a personal relationship with one another. That is there. Certainly, we recognize that personal, private contract between uh, two individuals. But we recognize that the promises that we are making to one another, we are also making to God. This is a sacred covenant that we enter into with one another, but also with God. See, this is God's marriage. This is why we can't do anything we want with it. We can't just say, you know, we want out of it because we made promises to God. This belongs to God. We have promised God that we are going to do everything we possibly can to make this work. We are in a relationship with each other. We are also in a relationship with God. Now, there's a private contract. 
there is the sacred covenant. But then we as Catholics, because we are talking about sacraments, we see marriage as more than simply a sacred covenant or a private um, uh, uh, agreement or a contract. We see those, we acknowledge those, but we also say that it is a sacrament. It is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace, to give grace. And that's what we, we need to, to focus on. So marriage is a sacrament. It's an outward sign. Now, what's the outward sign of marriage? I ask this a lot of times when I'm dealing with groups and talking about marriage, and almost everybody gets this wrong. Almost everybody gets this wrong. Most people will say, well, the sign, right, is the rings. And the rings are a sign, all right, but they're not the sign. All right, you can have, and there may be, and there are cultures uh, that have had marriage that uh, where rings are not used. That's not what they do. So they're an important sign, but they're not the sign. The sign of the sacrament of matrimony, of the sacrament of marriage, is the couple. The couple themselves are the sign. All right. Now, one of the traditions that kind of got into the church in the 1960s, uh, really kind of bleeding in from the culture, was the use of a unity candle, all right? And, um, and, uh, one of the, and I don't allow a unity candle, all right? In fact, I don't think most churches are, uh, Catholic churches are allowing that anymore. And there are good reasons for that, all right? The, the main reason is, is it's very confusing. It's very confusing. Because if it's not the rings and people say, oh, well, it's the candles, it's the candles. You know, when they take the outer candles and then they light the inner candle and then they blow the outer candle out, it's like two have become one. But then I had other people that would say, oh, well, you know, we want to keep uh, the outer candles lit because even though we're becoming one, we're still, we're still two separate individuals. And went on and on and on. And it was like, okay, this is, these are symbols that are so confused, so confused that they get in the way. So, and they pull away from the real sign which is the couple, the couple. Remember what I said about St. Paul. St. Paul said that marriage is a type of the relationship between Christ and his church. This was a husband and wife stand before one another on their wedding day, and they are exchanging vows, right? What are they saying to one another? They're saying essentially, I will love you all the days of my life. I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. I'm going to love you forever, no matter what. Now, who promises us that they're going to love us forever, no matter what? Well, that's God, and that's Christ. And so if I'm a bride, and I'm listening to my husband's vow, and he's saying to me, I will love you and honor you all the days of my life, if I have the ears of faith, I need to be able to hear that he represents Christ, that he represents God, who is telling me, I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. I will love you no matter what. And the groom, as he is listening to his bride, speak that same vow to him. We want him to be able to hear God saying, I'm with you. I love you forever, no matter what. I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. And so the husband and the wife become a sacred sign, an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace the couple not only receive the sacrament of matrimony, they become the sacrament of matrimony. They become an outward sign to one another, a sign to give grace to the other, to the other. Yes, they receive grace, but they are the channel of that grace into the lives of their spouse. They are the sign, they are the sign. That's only where it begins, that's where it begins. It also is to the children that hopefully are going to be born into this marriage. You know, we have a God who we say is Father, a God who is Abba. And why does that have any significant meaning for us except that our parents are the first real signs, they're the first real sacraments of God for us. Our parents are the ones that raise us, that feed us, that protect us us that care for us and in the sacrament of matrimony not only is a husband and a wife are they given the graces to be able to lay down their lives for one another they are also given the graces to lay down their lives for their children as they come together and they begin to create family 
They begin to create family. They're receiving the graces that they need for others. Now, again, going back to that image of St. Paul, where he says that marriage is a type of a relationship between Christ and his church. We, too, as we're seeing a couple getting married, or as we're seeing couples around us, faithful couples who are living out their marriage vows, if you ever sit and you watch somebody, a couple who are just kind of one of those remarkable couples, you just see how maybe after 20, 30, 40 years, and they still delight in one another. They still are just wonderful in the way in which they love one another. You see the willingness to sacrifice. Let me get, tell you, when I was growing up, my uh, grandfather uh, had a series of strokes which really reduced him to, uh, to like a child and physically just devastated him. And my grandmother kept him at home. They had a uh, hospital bed in their, be- in their bedroom. And she took care of him all the way up until the, the day of his death. She was there and she would feed him and she would change him, clean him. All right? And it was not a nice, pretty picture. It really wasn't. You, know, you think of love as, oh, it's so romantic. Well, this wasn't, there was nothing romantic about what we were seeing as kids as we were watching her take care of him. But we were seeing what love really looks like. We were seeing what love really looks at. We were were seeing what the cross within marriage really looks like as she was laying down her life to take care of her husband and doing some things that, uh, that we were looking and saying, I don't think I could ever do that. I don't think I could ever do that. And yet she was doing that. She was doing that. See, that's what we look at that and say, wait a minute, that's how Jesus loves me. See, Jesus was willing to do things for me that hurt, that involved great pain and great sorrow, that involved great humiliation and degradation. And he was willing to bear all of that for me. And so we look at this couple and the way in which they love one another, and we say, ah, that's how Jesus loves us. So the couple becomes an outward sign for us, for the whole church, for the whole church. That's why we get married in church. We're saying, okay, we don't want this just for ourselves. We want to be a sign. We want to be a sacrament for the church. So we're going to get married within the church so that we can be a sacrament for the church. So they are are an outward sign. Instituted by Christ, we've gone through and talked about that, how Jesus instituted, to give grace. And again, this is primarily actual grace grace. Now, you know better than I, most of you are married, and you who are married know better than I that marriage is not always easy. It is not always wonderful. It is not always fun. And sometimes it is very difficult. Part of the difficulty is our own selves. You know, we say, I'm going to love you and honor you all the days of my life, and I'm going to sacrifice myself for you. Well, there are days in which we don't want to sacrifice ourselves. There are days in which we don't want to lay down our lives for our spouse. There are days when we want to be selfish. We want to be self-centered. And we need a lot of actual grace. If we're going to overcome our own sinfulness and our own selfishness so that we can be who God is calling us to be. And we're given those graces. Same thing about being good parents. Being good parents. And we want to love our kids. There are days when it's not easy to love our kids. Some days it's not easy to set ourselves aside for them, especially as they get older and they, perhaps they get a little smart-mouthed with us and, and it's like, you know, you wonder, it's like, you know, why did I think I wanted you in my life? You know, and we have to love them anyway. You know, go through those phases where they're not cute, where they're not fun, and where they're not easy. And we have to love them anyway. We need the grace. We need the grace of the sacrament to live out the sacrifices and the challenges that, are, that go with being married and with being parents, of being that sacrament. Today, I don't want to be a sacrament. Today, I just want to be about myself. It's all of us. It's all of us. And sometimes if you've got a spouse, that some spouses are easier to love than others. Some spouses are easier to love than others. Some of you know better than I do what I'm talking about because you may have one of those. You may have one of those who's not that easy to love and who makes it very difficult. And after 30 years of that, you can be pretty worn down by trying to love somebody who is not easy to love. 
but you're given the grace to see. That's the wonderful thing in, this, in the sacrament of marriage. We are given the graces that we need to be more than we are, to give more than, we ca- than we're capable of giving on our own. Part of what we need to do as couples, and I think we need to learn how to do this, and I probably haven't talked about this very much either, and maybe not too many of us as priests have done that, is to teach us how to go back, those of us who have been married, those of you who have been married, and who have received the graces of that sacrament, how to go back and call upon those graces. So you have them. You've received them. You've received those graces. But you've got to know how to pull on that, pull the, pull pull those to yourself and to use them there may be times in your married life where you really need to pray and say god help me help me to get beyond my selfishness right because i don't really want to love today and i need your grace inside of me to help me do the right thing and sometimes it's like lord help me to find the graces that i need to forgive what's just happened to be compassionate and to be understanding when I'm really angry, when I'm really hurt, when I'm really disappointed. Help me. Help me. You've received, you who are married in the church, who have received the sacrament of marriage, of matrimony, you have received those uh, graces. But you've got to plug into them. You've got to call upon them. They don't just automatically flow. This is why we need to have a prayer life. This is why we need to uh, continually come to the Eucharist. This is why we continually come to the sacrament of reconciliation. So the sacrament of reconciliation. We come and say, you know, I failed to love my spouse. You know, I was selfish. I was, uh, I was harsh. I was mean. I was this. I was that. Lord, I'm sorry. I need the forgiveness that comes from the grace. But I need those actual graces. This is why we come to the Eucharist. This is why we come to communion. To receive Jesus living inside of us. To give us those actual graces so that we can be who he is calling us to be. And who in our heart of hearts we really want to be. I want to finish this up by talking about there are three questions. There are three questions that are asked as part of the marriage ceremony. Uh, The couple stand here before me and before the congregation and more importantly before God. And I say, have you come here freely and without reservation, to give yourselves to each other in marriage. And they say, we have. Now let's think about this. Have you come here freely, all right? It's not under pressure. It's not, you know, it's not a shotgun wedding. You know, I know my, uh, my father-in-law doesn't have a gun to my head. You know, um, I am here freely and without reservation to give yourselves to each other in marriage. To make yourself a gift to your spouse. So you don't get married for your sake, yourself. You get married for your spouse. To be a gift, to give myself away, to lay down my life. Have you come here freely to lay down your life for your spouse? To love your spouse, not just today, but the rest of your life. We have. We have. That's unity. That's the, uh, the uh, first essential quality of a real marriage is unity, that you are committing yourself to one another. You're coming together as one by giving yourselves to one another. The second question, will you love and honor each other as man and wife for the rest of your lives? Now this is about the indissolubility of marriage. Will you love and honor each other as man and wife for the rest of your lives? Now that's a scary thought if you really are aware on your wedding day what you're promising. This is where you're saying, I'm going to love you all the days of my life, no matter what, no matter what, and no matter what takes in a lot of territory. We all know that, right? We all know that it sounds wonderful on our wedding day, but some days it means a real sacrifice, a real sacrifice to to follow through on that promise. I'm going to love you. I'm going to love and honor you for the rest of my life. Are you, are you, have you come here to do that? Will you do that? We will. We will. And then finally, will you accept children lovingly from God and bring them up according to the law of Christ and his church? Now, this is the openness to fertility. Now, obviously, if you've got an older couple who uh, are beyond childbearing age, then obviously that's not going to happen. 
right? Sometimes you have a, a couple who also, maybe they've discovered this already uh, through previous uh, marriages or in si different situations um, where that's just not possible. It's not, you know, there is some, there's real fertility issues there. There may be somebody who is entering into a marriage who, uh, as a younger person, for whatever reason, made the, ch the choice to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, embrace sterility, right, to, uh, to, uh, to um, be made incapable of having children. And so what they have to say is that, you know, if a child comes, I'm open. I'm open to that. You know, I accept that, even though in the past I've taken actions which have probably closed that door. Have probably closed that door. So it has to be open to fertility. Um, unity, indissolubility, open to fertility. These are the th essential qualities of a marriage. See, if I'm saying to you, okay, I'm going to give myself to you in marriage, but I'm also going to keep open the idea that I can have some people on the side. You know, I can have friends with benefits on the side. Um, that's not a marriage. That's not anything like what we mean by a marriage. You have to be saying, I'm giving myself to you and only to you completely. And so it would be an invalid marriage if I'm saying something else. Indissolubility. If I say, oh, I'm going to marry you for a while, you know, uh, hopefully this is going to work out. If it doesn't, we'll get divorced and we can marry other people. Um, that invalidates a marriage. That's a validates a marriage. Again, I'll get into that uh, when, sometime when I go into more about, um, about what that means uh, in terms of annulments and, and divorce. And if I go into a marriage all right, where I am saying under no circumstances are there going to be any kids, I am not, I am not willing to have a child. If one or both of the couple are committed to that, that's an invalid marriage. See, these all three have to be present. They have to be present for a marriage to be what the church understands a marriage to be, all right? Unity, indissolubility, and openness to fertility. Marriage is a vocation, a vocation. Why do we get married? Well, I want to. I want to. Yeah, that's, that's an important part of it. You know, you shouldn't get married if you don't want to. But we have to understand that marriage is a sacrament, is a vocation. What that word means is that it is a call. Voca, voca, vocation. Voca means a call. So in the same way that a priest, when he gets ordained, does so because he believes that he has been called by God to that ministry, and the church has discerned with him that he is called by God, to serve the church as a priest or a deacon or a, or a bishop, right? So in marriage, marriage, marriage is a calling from God. And God doesn't just call you to, uh, to get married to, to anybody, all right? So what we want to do, what we want to do, if we're a couple, if any of you are couples that are in that process of, of deciding whether you're going to get married, that's a discernment process. The same way that a priest, a young man who is uh, working towards priesthood, has to discern is this call really coming from God? Or is this coming from my own selfishness? Is it coming from my own ego? Is it coming from the expectations of the culture? So a man or woman need to discern the will of God. Am I responding to the call of God? So this is marriage. This is marriage. There's a lot more. I encourage you to go to either the Catechism of the Catholic Church or to the United States um, um, Catechism for adults, which was put out by the U.S. bishops. There are other great books. I mentioned Christopher West, but there are others, great uh, writings on marriage, and specifically some great Catholic writers on marriage. I encourage you to check those out and to continually learn more about what is the vocation. What is it that God is calling you to do? What does it mean to be a good husband, to be a good wife, to be a good mother and a father, all right? I mean, as a priest, if I was to be ordained, which I was 40 years ago, and never read anything about priesthood, of never of trying to learn more and more, what does it mean to be a good priest? What does it mean to serve the church as a priest? If I did that and, and uh, if I accepted ordination but really never tried to grow in that, then I'm probably going to go. I'm probably going to go. You know, I, figure, I always think, you know, we're either, we either grow or we go. And that's probably true in marriage, too. If we're not growing in our uh, commitment to our marriage, if we're not growing 
in her understanding of how to live out the graces that are given to me in marriage. There's a good chance we're going to get in some real trouble, in some real trouble. So, um, this has been very unusual for me, standing here in front of an empty church, talking to you like you're here. And uh, for this uh, length of time, I hope that I've done uh, uh, a fairly good job with that. And next Tuesday at 1 o'clock, uh, we will have the next session, which will be on the Sacrament of Holy Orders. So as we get, pray, in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And the Lord be with you. The Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I hope I get to see you very, very soon. Thank you.